Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope uh, we didn't lose too many people after the social event last night in the, <laughs> in the dark and uh, with the drinking beers after. Uh, but and good to see most of you made it here this morning. Um, so we're going to start off the second day of talks with a keynote by Sumit Chantala, who's going to be talking about uh, PyTorch. Uh, I've, I'm actually a user of PyTorch. I think it's a fantastic deep learning framework, especially for experimentation. Uh, Sumith is a research engineer, right, at uh, Facebook AI Research in New York, <clears throat> and he's one of the core developers of uh, PyTorch. And uh, yeah, I'll leave the talk to Sumith. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Federico. Hello. Thank you for coming. Um, I will be talking about PyTorch today. And, oh, actually, give me one second. Yes. So uh, I'll be talking about PyTorch today. It's a, it's a deep learning framework, but also a scientific computing package. Um, this is the PyTorch team uh, of people from all over the world. And uh, we've been developing it for about a year now. Um, it, it actually started off as an intern project. Uh, so for, for those of you who don't know, um, there was a package called Torch that, that, that was written in uh, Lua uh, that we used to use a lot uh, in the deep learning community. I was one of the maintainers for that. Um, and the, like we, we ran Torch for a while, but the, one of the big downsides was that there was no ecosystem for Lua. Um, no standard library either, and like many other problems. And we were thinking of writing a new version uh, of Torch, and uh, there's no better ecosystem to compete with than uh, Python. And uh, we, we decided to go in this direction. Uh, but we also um, rewrote the design of PyTorch as well for to upgrade it. Uh, from Lua, which uh, from from Torch, which was about seven, eight years old. Um, so, uh, what is PyTorch? Um, it is uh, many things. Uh, f like fundamentally, it has uh, a NDRA library uh, with GPU support. So basically, you can think of it as uh, a NumPy alternative that also has uh, support for doing computations on GPU, um, and that apart that's the that forms the the absolute base and core of uh, PyTorch, um, and then there is an automatic differentiation package, so you can do computations and then you can take the derivatives of one. Uh, node in your computation with respect to another. So this is useful, uh, especially, uh, well, the way we designed it uh, was so that we can do particular uh, deep learning workloads uh, and uh, do a lot of AI research. Um, and uh, to support the automatic differentiation engine, we have a uh, optimization package uh, that does numerical optimization it implements uh, a lot of standard grade and decent uh, optimization methods. And uh, lastly, we have many utility packages uh, that uh, some of them I will be going through. They're mostly around like data loading, um, automatically downloading pre-trained models from, from the internet, etc. So uh, at any point of the talk, if you if you want to ask questions, please do raise your hand. Um, so after, OK. So uh, an NDRA library. So, so just like NumPy, 
uh, provides an NDRA object. Uh, PyTorch, uh, in PyTorch, we have a torch.tensor. Um, and you have different uh, tensor types, like you have torch.float tensor, double tensor, long tensor, and so on. Uh, by default, torch.tensor is alias to the default tensor type, which is uh, float tensor. Uh, we have many mathematical operations, linear algebra operations, uh, indexing. I mean, the standard suit of uh, operations you would expect on a multidimensional array library. And uh, we uh, have very fast acceleration on NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, we also have some work that is uh, getting this towards AMD GPUs, particularly AMD Vega cards, um, but that is ongoing work uh, along with AMD. Uh, all the unit tests are passing on the AMD thing, but there's still some perf issues. Okay, so to give you a little, to help you relate a little bit more uh, to PyTorch, don't worry if you can't read the code. Uh, I guess like it's uh, the letters are too small, but basically there's a side-by-side -side example of uh, a small uh, manually written, uh, I think uh, one dimension, uh, one layer uh, neural network that is doing some kind of uh, L2 loss and the left side is written in NumPy and the right side is written in PyTorch. And you can see that there's basically a lot of parallels uh, between the, both the APIs. So the PyTorch Tensor API is not an exact uh, API compatible with NumPy, but all the operations that you would expect uh, in NumPy are present in PyTorch, uh, probably with slightly different function signatures. Um, and there is no particularly good reason to not have adopted the NumPy API. It's just that we were coming from our own legacy of uh, uh, coming from Lua Torch to writing PyTorch. So we carried that API over, but we are slowly making uh, transformations uh, to the API to make it look more and more like NumPy. Um, so with a slightly bigger font. Uh, the NDRA library, you can create tensors, you can print them, um, you can, you know, we have, like we have a random package, um, you can create randomly initialized tensors, you know, you can create, print their sizes, and uh, you can do standard indexing, um, like basic and advanced indexing, uh, just just like you would uh, do to NumPy arrays. Uh, you can do standard mathematical operations. Here I'm just like adding up two tensors, X and Y. Um, one of the things we can do is that you can convert from a, a torch tensor to a NumPy array and back uh, without any memcopy. Uh, so it's basically like a free operation, especially if, uh, if the torch tensor is in the CPU. So uh, under the hood, NumPy provides a nice API uh, for this and we leverage that. Um, so you can create a torch tensor, convert it to a NumPy uh, array, and then make changes to the NumPy array. And then the changes will automatically be reflected in the torch tensor because uh, the underlying memory pointers uh, are, are the same. And similarly, you can create a NumPy array and convert it to a, a torch tensor. And uh, you would again see that if you change the NumPy array or change the torch sensor, the chains are reflected in, in, in the other direction as well. Uh, here is a small example of me showing that I show that I add on the number one to A, which is a torch tensor and then this, the NumPy array that, that uh, it was converted from also changed. Um, so all the uh, torch sensors on the CPU except for uh, the car tensor support converting to NumPy and back. Um, then coming to GPU tensors, it's uh, kind of very 
explicit uh, on how tensors are used on the GPU. So if you have a particular tensor, to put it on the GPU, you call dot CUDA on the tensor. And then what, if you have a torch.float tensor and you call dot CUDA on it, then you would get a torch.cuda.float tensor as your return type. And that tensor is now pointing to a memory region on the GPU. If you do any computations on it, then the results will also be on the same GPU. Uh, and only if you want to transfer it back to the CPU, you call dot CPU on that particular uh, torch.cuda.float uh, tensor. And again, you will get back a torch.float tensor. Um, the reason we have an explicit model like this, rather than trying to hide it where all of your intermediates are NumPy arrays, for example, is because uh, doing CPU to GPU transfers is a fairly expensive operation, and you wouldn't want to um, you wouldn't want to have this like um, automatic way of trying to like figure out where to keep memory and so on. Doing it explicit also gives the user a lot of power. Um, so that is uh, a, an overview of our uh, of our tensor library. Um, we do have um, all of the standard linear algebra functions uh, with LEPAC interfaces. And uh, um, if there's something missing on the CPU side, for example, you could always just convert the tensor to a NumPy array and call um, you know, SciPy uh, NumPy operations. Um, OK. Coming to my uh, next uh, section, which is the automatic uh, differentiation engine. So, um, so far I showed like how you could use the standard tensor library. So the automatic differentiation engine, um, I will show it by example. Um, what it is, is you would do a bunch of tensor operations and then you can then take the gradients of one of the results with respect to another. Um, and this is often useful uh, if you're trying to do gradient descent based uh, machine learning. As an example, uh, so we provide uh, in the autograd package, we, we named it autograd because there's a lot of history to that. Um, there's also a Python autograd package. Um, which is basically the original automatic differentiation package by uh, some of the Harvard folks. We named ours torch.autograd uh, due to a comedy of errors. Uh, the right name for it probably would be torch.autodiff. Uh, anyways, so in our autograd package, we have uh, an object called variable, uh, a class called variable. So a variable is something that r loosely wraps a tensor. So you put a tensor inside a variable, and then on this variable, you can do a lot of operations. And then what, ha like what was the sequence of operations will be recorded by this variable object. And then uh, in, in this example, I create four random tensors, x, WH, WX, and uh, PREVH. This is a small, like, recurrent network-ish, uh, uh, recurrent network style uh, graph. Uh, and I, I create these four uh, initial tensors, which I will call leaf variables, because these are user-created tensors. That is, these are not intermediate variables that were the results of some operation. The user explicitly created them. And then, I will do two matrix multiplies on them uh, to get this resulting graph. And then I will add the results of those two matrix multiplies. And I will finally get the node next hedge. So this is my graph. And then finally, I will add a, uh, a tan edge uh, operation. Um, on the next edge. So in terms of my computation that I've done so far, this is what the computation graph looks like. And it, the variable next hedge has a pointer to um, 
the tan h function, which in turn has a pointer to the add function. And you can basically recreate the entire computation graph from the last variable next h. So if you want to compute the derivative of uh, next h with respect to uh, any of the leaf variables up there, like, like wh or h or wx or x, then what you would do is you would call next h dot backward uh, with some uh, gradients with respect to next h. And then what will happen is the gradients with respect to gradients of next h with respect to all of the leaf nodes will then be accumulated into the dot grad attribute of, uh, of each of those leaf variables, um, specifically uh, x, prev, h, w, h, and w, x. And so um, this is basically how our autograd engine works by example. Um, to give a more concrete and fuller uh, neural networks example, um, so this is a short example of creating a neural network. Um, in the first uh, constructor section, we are just creating particular uh, layers uh, that we would like to use in our neural network. This, this kind of neural network, it's called a convolutional neural network. Uh, so we create some convolution layers, some uh, affine transform layers, and then, um, we define a forward function, uh, and the forward function, uh, basically, it takes the inputs, and then you define how you transform the inputs to get the output, uh, uh, the output uh, final result. And so the forward function is just like a standard Python piece of code. You just, uh, you can use the layers that you created in your constructor. And you can do various other operations, uh, torch operations, and then you, you get your result uh, that you return. And this is basically how you define a neural network. Uh, and then you can create an instantiation of the neural network uh, in, uh, in the last line. And then you can pass inputs to the network and then call backward on it. And then the gradients uh, with respect to um, each of the uh, uh, parameters defined in the network will be accumulated into their grad attributes. And then you can do some kind of gradient descent uh, method. And to do the gradient descent steps, we provide a, an optimization package, which is kind of has a very simple interface. We implement uh, many methods that are standard in the neural network literature. Uh, stochastic, gra stochastic gradient descent, Erigrad, RMS prop, LBFGS, Adam, and so on. Um, and basically, this is typically how a training loop for your neural network would look like. You would iterate over your inputs and some target values on your data set. You would zero the, the previous gradients, and you would uh, pass your input through your neural network. And in this case, it's uh, called model. And then you would get a particular output. And then you would take your output and some target value that you want your neural network to compute. And then you would compute some loss function that compares your output to the target value and uh, produces some how far away is your output from your target value. And then you will compute the gradients uh, with respect to that loss function for all of your parameters by calling loss.backward. And then all of the gradient steps are accumulated, uh, all of the gradients are accumulated in those particular parameters of your neural network. And then when you call optimizer.step, um, uh, then the neural network will take a small uh, gradient descent step where the weights of its, uh, weight, where its weights will be slightly transformed to have less of an error the next time it computes uh, some input target uh, question. Uh, the optimizer doesn't solve like right? 
Um, so the question is, the optimization is itself implemented in terms of torch operations. So can you do meta optimization? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, you can uh, create an optimizer that itself is some kind of parameterized model that will provide like the great and decent step and it is learning how to optimize as well. You could do like all of these inception style uh, stuff. Um, okay, so now uh, just, I gave you like a rough overview of like the basic packages, but I presume a lot of you uh, are not following a lot or it's just uh, early in the morning. Um, so I, uh, what's left is I will go through uh, what typical machine learning workflows look like, especially in the deep learning space. Um, and what are the usual pain points of dealing with, uh, you know, building these workflows and how, how PyTorch can help in dealing with them. Uh, and then like a one slide summary of like what are the core philosophies of PyTorch when we develop uh, this package and uh, to guide our future. And then lastly, I will talk a little bit about the upcoming features in PyTorch. Uh, so uh, talking about ML workflows, uh, typically uh, in my short experience, this is kind of what I think machine learning workflows are like you uh, or your advisor or your friend will have an idea um, and or some theory that you came up with and then you want to design experiments to to validate or uh, invalidate that theory uh, and then you would uh, select some data sets or like some appropriate environments to validate this and you would uh, pre-process your data or set up your environments you would implement your particular models, uh, like all kinds of machine learning models, and then you would train and you would have some part of your data set be a validation set and some part of it be a testing set. And so you would do training and validation and finally you would test your uh, final model, see if it works, and then if it works, you would publish it. If not, you would write a blog post. Um, so, So Python combined with PyTorch is one environment to do all of this. It's not the only one, definitely not, but it is one. And uh, let me go into like how PyTorch uh, can help you do some of these, uh, some of these blocks here. So uh, writing data loaders, uh, I think it's one of the most horrible parts of um, doing machine learning workflows. It's annoying, it's not rewarding, uh, but it has to be done. So the problem is every data set is slightly differently formatted, um, slightly differently uh, processed, and when you get it, there's some noise in the data set of various form, or you know it's written in some like XML format that you have to parse. So what you need typically is some kind of like some kind of pre-processing uh, on this data set that is consistent. And uh, typically when you're using uh, GPUs um, to train your neural network models on these data sets, GPUs are generally like fairly fast machines. So you would need your data pre-processing to not become a bottleneck while you're training your neural network. Um, so you would need a multi-threaded data loader or like some kind of data loader that will like alleviate some the CPU bottlenecks that you might have. So our solution to these things is the first is we are we're like we have packages that share all of the data loaders across the PyTorch community, so that you don't have to write the same data loader that some other person somewhere wrote. And it's been fairly successful. We've been getting pull requests to add more and more data sets, especially academic data sets. 
Um, we have a vision package, uh, a, a text package, and then we just started an audio package. Um, but this is not really limited to like, oh, do you need to use PyTorch data loaders to use PyTorch? And no, you can just use regular Python to uh, write like uh, Torch data sets and leverage, you can leverage existing Python code. As an example, uh, this is a project called Parlay that we at Facebook released. Um, you have like 20 question and answering data sets and interfaces to them. And you can just, like, it's a standard Python API, and you, you can use this to write, like, you know, PyTorch data loaders. Um, in practice, uh, this is how the code uh, looks like. Um, and so if you're writing a script to train a network on a bunch of, uh, uh, on a bunch of data sets, you would just have, like, uh, some conditionals based on, like, whatever your command line uh, is parsing. It's like, oh, if, if my command line says my data set is Elson, then I would just have this one um, snippet that would initialize the Elson data set and specify how to pre-process the data set. Um, and the last line uh, here is, so we have uh, two abstractions. One is called a data set and the other is called a data loader. The data loader takes a data set and just makes it into like a multi-processing beast so that you just have parallel processing um, while you're like doing, like loading data from disk or doing pre-processing. So the data loader takes in a data set and takes in the number of workers you want to um, use to process this data set and you have some other options like, you know, whether you want to shuffle your data set um, or, um, how big of a mini batch you want to load uh, per per iteration and so on, um, and actually writing a new data set for a new uh, for a new um, sorry writing a new torch data set for for um, a data set that you want to use is also not that hard. Uh, the interface is uh, only you have you only have to implement uh, two functions. Uh, uh, you have to subclass from the torch.dataset class, and then you have to implement the getItem class, which takes um, an index. So if your dataset has 10,000 samples, and those samples can be, let's say, images or audio clippings or some sentences. So the getItem function will just take the particular index of uh, the sample that you want to load in your data set. If you have 10,000, then like your index can range from zero to 9999. And then that, that function will just define how to load that particular uh, index from, from uh, and pre-process it. And then the other function that you need to implement is the length operator that just defines like how big your data set is. Um, and it's, uh, and it's fairly mechanical to implement uh, a new data set, you know, like you just define how to load it from disk and, or, and you know, pre-process it and so on. Um, and lastly, uh, for data loaders, which are the multi-processing uh, helpers for data sets, uh, what we ended up doing in PyTorch is we did a small fork of uh, the Python multi-processing package. Um, uh, and just put it under the torch.multiprocessing namespace. Um, the only thing we did was instead of using the standard Python pickler, we use a custom pickler, which whenever it encounters tensors um, being passed through from one process to another, it instead of pa like serializing the tensor and then deserializing it on the other side, it just like, sh like puts the tensor into uh, system shared memory and then it just like shares tensors across the processes. So if you change the tensor in one process, like the change is gonna be reflected on another, the other process, for example. Um, and this is kind of uh, both needed for efficiency um, because Python pickling uh, is uh, fairly slow. Um, and also it's useful when you're trying to implement certain uh, variants of uh, training loops where let's say you want to have multiple copies of your neural network 
all in different processes, but doing different things and optimizing different things. Um, so um, if you want to know more subtleties of general Python multiprocessing, there's a talk at 2.15, I think, uh, by um, um, one of your uh, upcoming speakers. And the, the uh, content of the talk goes into like a lot of very, very important subtleties in multiprocessing. Uh, you should definitely uh, go for that. Um, and lastly, apart from like, you know, loading data sets, you know, disk-based data sets or uh, text-based data sets, you would also want to interface with environments. Um, for example, like video game environments or um, if you, like, you know, the real world, you have like a real-time camera somewhere. And pretty much every environment provides a Python API. So there's like not much else you really need to do to natively interact with your en environment separately. Um, so that covers the data loading part. And uh, the next like couple of slides are gonna be about how to, like how PyTorch really helps you do better debugging and uh, do like, you know, easier like uh, profiling of your code, finding hotspots. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of context on why um, these slides are there. Um, in the deep learning uh, framework space, it is not obvious that if you use some framework that just say has a Python API that you could use the Python debugger, for example. Because uh, like a lot of these frameworks are provided as black boxes where you create your model, but then when you run it, it's run in some kind of C++ runtime, so you can't actually, you know, uh, set Python breakpoints and see what's going on and print things and so on. So uh, that is particularly why I do mention that in, with PyTorch, PyTorch is just a Py, C Python extension. It doesn't work with PyPy or other variants, but um, you can use your favorite uh, Python debugger. You can use PyCharm, you can use uh, uh, PDB, uh, you can use print, for example, um, and it's kind of uh, as smooth as debugging other parts of your Python code. Um, and similarly, if you want to profile your code, identify bottlenecks, you can use your favorite um, favorite uh, profiler uh, and like from Python. Um, now, uh, for for these profiling, it, it's not going to go into um, the C code and further break down like which parts of the C code are um, um, being a bottleneck. But usually, when you're doing PyTorch stuff. The, gran the granularity of uh, hotspots you would find is at the Python level. So this particularly not uh, um, gonna disable you when you're doing identifying bottlenecks, for example. And uh, lastly, uh, PyTorch is written so that you don't have any runtime compilation time. Uh, so if you use a package like uh, Tiano, for example, um, to do certain optimization, th like, like what they would do is they would invoke GCC at runtime, like stitch C code, and then like compile it. But like these things generally take time. And uh, from the beginning, uh, PyTorch has been built so that as a user, you don't actually wait on anything, you use it as uh, you use PyTorch, and you get a feel of a sp scripting language pretty much. Um, and we we basically precompile all of the kernels we we really need. Uh, but I mean that comes with a slight downside, which is that the binaries that we ship are fairly large. Um, a PyTorch binary is about 400, 450 MB. Most of it is like pre-compiled GPU kernels, um, which we can't, you know, we don't want, like it's that, we don't want to specialize them at runtime for performance because that means that as a user, you're waiting 
on on uh, on something to be happening. Um, so yeah, that's the only downside. Our binaries are fairly large. Um, so uh, this slide is kind of useless uh, for this audience, but yes, if you use PyTorch, you can use any of your favorite packages, even while writing neural network layers, you can use SciPy, scikit-learn. Um, as a small anecdotal example, uh, this user called Brandon Amos, he wrote some really complicated um, thing that he couldn't do in other frameworks. Um, but more importantly, he interspersed like like PyTorch stuff, uh, went into SciPy for certain operations, came back, and like all of these are pretty natural when you're writing PyTorch layers. Um, and we even have tutorials of like, okay, if you wanna write like a PyTorch extension, can you implement parts of it in NumPy and uh, leverage SciPy, for example? Um, so another thing uh, that, that we uh, have in PyTorch uh, that also tries to create a community and share things is um, users can share uh, their neural network models uh, across the community. And um, just with like, say, uh, one line of code, you can get a pre-trained network trained on some data set um, that was trained by someone else in the community, and that just saves you a lot of academic uh, research time. Um, uh, for example, someone took all of the uh, all of the models in the PyTorch model zoo, and they they just wanted to see if that particular neural network, which was trained and uh, computed in 32-bit floating precision, if they quantized it to various bits how the accuracy of the neural network would uh, uh, degrade. And some, like, you know, doing something like this, if you already have pre-trained models, it's, it's kind of much easier uh, to do. Um, so one of the things you will notice uh, in, in uh, PyTorch is we built all the APIs so that you, as a user, um, will um, build code with some, like you have a linear style of programming. Um, that is like, you will like, you know, you will write code like top down and like you can, um, you, you can uh, interactively write it in iPython notebooks, for example. And this, like there's other models of uh, uh, building neural networks and doing training as well, like usually people build a particular neural network beforehand and, and then they run it in some other part engine. So if there's something that they wanna debug, they would have to like relate their debug message to like where they constructed the neural network, which is what I call nonlinear um, dependencies. But in PyTorch, like you can basically have a linear code flow and you, like debugging is also fairly uh, easier. This is not something in the neural network world is not unique to PyTorch, um, but to build this automatic differentiation engine uh, uh, that is interactive and imperative, we, uh, the fundamental bottleneck uh, before uh, PyTorch came out was that like these packages had a huge like node creation and like bookkeeping overhead. Uh, we spent a lot of time like micro optimizing our automatic differentiation engine so that the um, overhead of node creation of bookkeeping is uh, at the max uh, not more than like 20 to 30 microseconds, which is quite large um, for uh, if you have like very, very small um, computation workloads. But in general, the workloads that we've been seeing in the community and the workloads that we care about, that overhead is fairly okay. And we're of course working uh, on uh, reducing that even further. Um, the other options that you have in the community generally have a few milliseconds or more um, of, uh, of node creation overhead, especially like if you have an interactive mode. Um, okay, coming to uh, the second last section, which is the philosophy of PyTorch. 
Um, these are basically what we, we kind of uh, keep in mind. We want to stay out of the way of the user. Uh, we don't want to like overburden them with uh, uh, like abstractions or um, like complicated API procedures. Um, we want to cater to the impatient. We want things to be always be interactive, uh, quick, um, no compilation time. Uh, we want to promote a linear and interactive code flow, um, and uh, we want to be uh, interoperating with the Python ecosystem as naturally as possible, um, and we want to be as fast as any other package that that uh, provides the same features that we do. And uh, the last section is the recent and upcoming features, uh, which uh, might be useful uh, in context of like existing users, but also might be useful otherwise. So distributed PyTorch is something we released about a month ago as part of our point two release. Um, it's an MPI style uh, distributed communication. So you can basically exchange tensors between multiple nodes and multiple machines or multiple processes. Um, and you can uh, also do like uh, reductions. For example, you can say, there I have these tensors uh, on each of my machines. I want to compute the, the overall sum of all of these tensors into, into the same buffers. Um, and you can you do scatters, gathers, and so on. This, is, this style of uh, distributed programming is called an MPI style. Um, we introduced that package. We have examples of how to use this in terms of neural network training. If you have multiple nodes with multiple CPUs or GPUs, like how, how can you leverage all of them at the same time to make your uh, training accelerate faster? Um, and then uh, we introduced uh, a feature to compute not just the first differential um, um, through our automatic differential package, but also like higher order derivatives. Um, and this is kind of useful to implement uh, more crazy ideas in, uh, in research and uh, in, in, in practice um, a lot of uh, recent research uh, seems to be using higher order gradients for implementing some of their ideas. Um, so that's something we implemented. Um, and until uh, the point two release, PyTorch didn't have NumPy style broadcasting or advanced indexing. Um, across the library, we've implemented this now. Um, and that, that's been pretty useful for a lot of our users. Um, and this uh, last feature I want to talk about is uh, uh, just-in-time compilation. This is an upcoming feature. We have pull requests open for this, and you know we're in various levels of code review slash changes. Um, but basically, um, I described to you how PyTorch uh, computation graphs are built, and you know you can do a f you can do a forward and a backward, and you you have neural network models. Now. All of this computation is interactive, which means that the amount of optimization we can do to make the, the computation go faster on your particular hardware is very limited. So what we ended up building is a tracing just-in-time compiler um, that can cache and compile your graphs and subgraphs. Um, I'll, I'll explain to you what a tracing JIT is in like very, very simple terms. If there's like compiler experts in the audience, don't kill me. Um, but basically, let's say you have a function foo that takes an input tensor x, and it first computes the total sum of all elements of the tensor. And if the sum is less than 5, it uh, returns x plus 1. Otherwise, it returns x plus 2. So let's let, take it two example tensors, x and x2. Uh, in retrospect, I should have called it x1 and x2. Well, OK. So x um, doesn't sum to uh, 5, um, and x2 uh, sums to more than 5. So 
if you do foo of x, you would get um, basically x plus 1. Uh, and if you do foo of x2, you would do get x plus 2. And now, um, let me explain what a tracing JIT would look like. So now let's say that we call torch.jit.traced of foo. And then you would get a new function called JIT foo. And you pass, you pass uh, uh, x through JIT foo. And this is what happens. There is a, the, the, the tracing engine that, that is running somewhere is going to like trace the operations of what all the operations that are happening on tensors um, in in that particular Python function. So as you do that line sum uh, equals x dot sum, it would record that x was passed into the sum function, and you got some output variable t1. And then um, here sum is just like a Python float, so it doesn't record anything there. And then it, when you return x plus 1, it records that you added x to 1, and then that's your return value. So that's your, uh, that's your trace that gets recorded. And then you would get the output 0, 1, 2, 3, just like above. Now, what a tracing JIT is, is it, it records a trace of what happened. And then next time when you want to run that function, instead of running the actual Python function, it will just run the trace again and again. Um, and it can do various optimizations on the trace to make it more efficient. So when uh, you run JIT foo of x2, what actually happens is that it will run the trace instead of the actual Python function. It will just sum x uh, and give an output variable t1, which is basically unused in, 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 uh, uh, in computing the return value. And then uh, it will add x to 1 uh, and then return x plus 1. And as you see, this is the wrong result uh, to compute. And that's, but that's kind of how the tracing JIT works. So basically, you would want to apply um, torch.jit.trace to functions that usually don't have conditionals, that usually have just like a straight line uh, computation without uh, um, without the control flow. Um, so uh, s depends on like the syntactic sugar you want to use, but instead of uh, using torch.jit.trace, you could just annotate your function with a decorator that will do the tracing for you. Now, I hope you guys got a good understanding of how the tracing it works. Now, looking at the benefits, if you, uh, if you go back to this trace here, um, while computing this trace, the first operation, sum of x to t1, is absolutely useless because uh, you don't use it to compute the return value. So once you get the trace, you can send it to like a compiler optimizer, which will remove the dead code that is not needed. It will also do various things like uh, operator fusion. So most of the operators that, that we use, especially like in PyTorch or in NumPy, they're all bandwidth bound, which means that the operations are running as fast as how fast you can transfer them into uh, CPU registers from, from main memory and then back again. So you can do what we call kernel fusion, which is like you can try to combine multiple operations uh, into inner loops and generate a new C function that does like multiple operations at once and much more efficiently. Another benefit of doing compilation is you can do stuff like out of order execution, where like if you have code that does instruction one, two, and three, but instructions uh, one, uh, two, and three don't depend on each other, you can change the order of instructions to uh, maybe run them more optimally. And lastly, you can uh, do automatic work placement. For example, if some of your CPUs are free and not being used, you can, say, offload some of the computation onto these free CPUs 
uh, even though the user has never specified explicitly to do so. Um, we, in the, com in the uh, tracing JIT that we built, um, we have, uh, at the moment, we have uh, optimization passes to do uh, operator fusion and ge generate more optimized code code, well, code. Um, and uh, another feature we have is you can use the tracer to export your models from, from PyTorch to another, another uh, framework um, and, for example, run it in purely C++ runtimes. Um, and with that, I conclude my talk. Uh, the last slide I have is just um, a, some, like an overview of like who is involved with PyTorch and um, thank you for having me here. If you have any questions, I will take them, though not sure how much time there oh, is. No. Yeah. So, questions? Uh, start raising your hand if you have questions so I can go to you. So, thank you very much for your talk. Um, concerning the NumPy um, compatibility, um, would you expect this project somehow to supersede PyCuda or PyOpenCL in that sense, what you could do also with NumPy? Um. So PyCuda, if I remember correctly, is um, is like a low-level interface to CUDA. So this project is slightly orthogonal to PyCuda in that sense. For example, you can write new uh, PyTorch CUDA kernels in PyCuda instead of writing in C++. Uh, PyCuda itself, from what I know, doesn't have like you know like a NDRA abstraction and stuff. Um, I, so I guess it's like a lower level package that you can use in conjunction with PyTorch. I wouldn't expect it to replace PyCuda. Um, it's just orthogonal. Um, I would expect it to be like, there's some, uh, there's some packages like I think CUDA mat or like there's some like Python, CUDA, NDRA libraries that are uh, lying around, it probably will be a replacement for those. Would you use PyTorch for production kind of things, or would you say, and if yes, do you have any pointers for blog posts or so to learn what people do to do that? Sure. Um, generally, production means various things. If you're okay with shipping Python into production, yes, we would absolutely use PyTorch into production. But it depends on like where you work or like what your production systems look like. Sometimes you wouldn't want to ship Python into production, um, and in that case, is we wouldn't want to use PyTorch into production. Like we made an explicit choice that PyTorch will have a hard dependency on Python. Um, that comes with huge benefits, but also like the downside that you have to ship Python wherever you want to ship PyTorch. Um, but um, as of my last slide, as I said, the tracer can be used to like export models to like purely C++ runtimes. So it can use PyTorch for like R&D, and then you can like export the traces uh, and run it in pure C++ runtimes for like those kinds of production environments. Um. I, I was curious, um, so you said that you can mix, one of the strengths of PyTorch is that you can mix PyTorch with other uh, Python, uh, like the rest of the SciPy stack and so forth. Uh, how does uh, the automatic differentiation play with if you call into a lot of SciPy functions which are written in C? Um, so if, you're, uh, if you want to write a particular autograd node in, in that leverages SciPy, for example. You'd write the forward and backward uh, okay. yourself. And then you explicitly are telling PyTorch how to do that differentiation. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Oh. 
the question is, you said, you talked about fusing operations. Will they be supported on the GPU too? Actually, the, the, the current status is that we've only implemented this for the GPU at the moment, because that's where they matter like much more. So we are, almost all of the PyTorch like priorities are around GPUs. We first implement things for the GPUs and then we do it for the CPU. Um, uh, how does this uh, compare to TensorFlow? Like, when would you advise, advise to use TensorFlow versus PyTorch? Well, if you ask me, I would always advise to use PyTorch. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's something that's, uh, that's providing the same high-level functionality as TensorFlow. It's, you know, providing uh, differentiation and providing neural networks and providing a tensor package and stuff. Um, but in TensorFlow, you can't really use a lot of the Python ecosystem. Like, you can't write TensorFlow nodes that call into Python, for example. Like, use SciPy, for example. Um, and you can't use like the standard Python debugging tools. You have to use TensorFlow's own debugger and stuff. So, um, but the upside of TensorFlow is that when you have the question of like, oh, can we ship to purely C++ runtimes or can we ship to mobile, uh, it becomes easier in TensorFlow. So like, depending on what your trade-offs are, what you care about, use PyTorch or TensorFlow, I guess. Okay. Um, oh, uh, Olivia. Olivia, can you just ask? Um, the question is: Do you plan to support other hardware platforms besides GPUs? Um, can you give me examples? Right. So we, I mean, if they have usable APIs, and I mean, you, if they have public APIs and stuff, like we, we have plans to extend PyTorch to other other uh, hardware platforms. Um, it's just like a matter of like when and like when those things mature. Like for example, um, it's no different for us to support. Uh, new hardware platform versus supporting AMD GPUs, for example. Like, we have to write a, another engine that will add all of the functionality for that particular AMD GPU. Um, and we already started, like, testing that and supporting that. So, like, it, it would be equally, um, in terms of priorities, we, we, we care about it if people care about it enough, and we don't have any problem supporting it. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much.